Let me start off today's program by asking you a question. How do you define waste? We all know that waste is an act of using something carelessly, over extravagantly or for no purpose. So when someone tells you that what you're doing is a waste of time, it's really saying that whatever it is that you're devoting time to doesn't deserve the attention or effort that you put in. But what man considers as waste could be very valuable in God's sight. One of the most beautiful stories in the Bible happened after Jesus raised Mary's brother, Lazarus, from the dead. In her gratitude, Mary did something amazing. She poured out very costly perfume and anointed the feet of Jesus. To Judas, who was witnessing that act, it was an absolute waste. Yet to Mary, it was an act of devotion. She was pouring out her life to the Lord in response to the miracle He had performed in her life. You are about to see how that one encounter with Jesus became a defining moment for both Judas and Mary. Their attitude and response determined the eventual outcome and destiny of their lives. But before that, let's watch this really encouraging testimony by three sisters. Hi Church, I'm Madeline and these are my sisters Elaine and Shuwen. We have been in City Harvest for the past 14 years. When we first came to church, we were still students. Our family was not well to do. I remember when I graduated from NUS in 2001, I chose not to take any studio shots in my graduation gown because we didn't have any money for that. But I encouraged my two sisters to study hard so that one day we could take a family portrait wearing our gowns. The dream of me getting a degree was quite far-fetched. I dropped out of school at the age of 17 due to poor results and the family financial difficulties. This badly affected my self-esteem. As a middle child, I felt unloved by my parents. I struggled with depression because I felt that my parents preferred my sisters rather than me. Once, after a bad quarrel with my mom, I was crying in my room and I actually heard a voice inside my head telling me to jump off from the 11th story. Although I didn't, I continue to feel very purposeless and aimless in my life. In 1999, Madeline invited me to City Harvest and I received Christ on my second visit. God started to do amazing things in my life. I decided to take up a private diploma course in computer studies the following year. When you have God in your life, what a difference it makes. Out of eight modules, I scored seven distinctions. Thank you. Thank you, Jesus. I then had an amazing encounter with God that gave me a passion to preach His Word. I decided to enroll into the School of Theology to equip myself. God is so good because after SOT, I did a degree in Business Studies instead. A door was open for Elaine to do her degree in South Australia. She was initially very hesitant because we did not have the money to support her. We took a bank loan for the tuition fees and Madeline helped out with her living expenses. Elaine also worked part-time as a cashier in an Asian supermarket over there. She relied on God for courage and faith and joined a local church. She made new friends and even gave Bible study of our church to her Australian friends. Finally, in 2010, Elaine graduated from the University of South Australia with a Bachelor of Business Administration. Today, Elaine is working full-time in our church as a zone supervisor. So our dream of taking a family graduation photo finally came to pass in 2011. But ever since the three of us came to Christ, we have been praying for our parents' salvation. Their marriage had always been rocky since we were young. But by God's grace, our mother came to the Lord eight years ago. And eventually, through our encouragement and prayer, she kept loving our father and stayed on in the marriage. In July 2012, our dad suddenly lost strength in his left arm and leg. We thought he had suffered a stroke, but it turned out that his neck, spine had decompressed his nerves badly. An operation was needed. However, due to his weak heart that was only pumping at 20%, he could not go through with the operation. So the three of us took turns to care for him. You know, we took turns to fetch him back and forth hospitals and Chinese doctors for days and weeks. Our dad was very touched by our practical love. He took it upon himself to stop smoking and drinking. He became a changed man. We invited him for our church 23rd anniversary here in Suntec. 
It was a huge breakthrough that he even came. Last December, our dad joined us for our Christmas Eve celebration. And this time, he accepted Jesus Christ as his Lord and Saviour. Today in the Chinese church, he praises God and lifts up his hands while worshipping him. In February this year, our dad's heart condition miraculously improved and a doctor could schedule him for an operation. The operation was a success. Today, he is going, undergoing rehabilitation program and we are believing God for his total healing and recovering in the days to come. Amen. Praise the Lord. So we have been in City Harvest for the last 14 years and we are all serving as cell group leaders today. We came to this church as students and today we are all graduates from universities. I am working as a vice president in a local bank while Elaine and she are full-time staff in City Harvest Church. We have also all graduated of, from School of Theology. Most of all, our entire family are now Christians worshipping God in church. Hallelujah! Promises mean much to each of us. And we all value those who keep their promises to us. The promises of God are yes and amen. Every good gift that He has prepared for you is irrevocable. It will never return to Him void. It will always be fulfilled in your life. Kong and Son have put together a collection of promises from God's Word called Irrevocable. To receive your copy of Irrevocable, please visit konghee.com. These unchanging promises will give you the encouragement and hope you need to face the challenges of life. Help Kong continue to reach a world that needs this powerful truth. Again, please visit the website to order your copy from Kong He Ministries. Look for the offer Irrevocable, promises from God directly for your life today. God has given each of us promises to comfort, encourage, and bring joy even during the most troubling times. Visit konghee.com to get your copy of Irrevocable. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for He who promised is faithful. In John chapter 12 and Mark chapter 14, there is a parallel story. Jesus Christ was invited to a party held in honor of Him. Why? Because days earlier, He had just performed one of the greatest miracles in His three and a half years of earthly ministry. Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead. He raised Lazarus from the dead. Now, as the people mingle and fellowship in this party, Mary did something truly amazing. In John chapter 12 and verse 3, Mary took a pound of very costly oil or spike nut and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair and the house was filled with the fragrance of the oil. What did Mary do? She came and knelt down at Jesus' feet, poured out a very costly bottle of perfume and the whole room was filled with fragrance. Now immediately, some people got very upset. In verse 4, one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, who would betray him, said, Why was this fragrant oil not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? This he said, not that he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief and had the money box, and he used to take what was put in it. Now, Judas got upset because it was a very expensive bottle of perfume. How expensive was this oil or spike nut? It was 300 denarii. Now, you got to remember, one denarius is one day's salary. So 300 denarii basically is one year's wages. This bottle was very costly because the perfume was not just money to feed hungry stomachs. This perfume was her dowry. It was Mary's dowry, her passport to a happy marriage and a wonderful family. To Mary, pouring out her dowry at Jesus' feet was a sacrifice of absolute highest. It was a sacrifice of the highest magnitude. 
But to Judas and to those like him, it was considered a waste. Mark 14 and verse 4, there were some who were indignant among themselves. That means they got upset. And they said, why was this fragrant oil wasted? What did they say? What a waste. For it might have been sold for more than 300 denarii and given to the poor. And they criticized her sharply. Now, how do you define waste? I checked the dictionary. Waste is defined as an act of expanding something carelessly, extravagantly, or to no purpose. The act of using or expanding something carelessly. You were careless in using it. You see, to Judas, it was such a waste to pour out an expensive perfume on Jesus Christ. Why? To him, what's the purpose? To him, Jesus was not worth your careless, extravagant sacrifice. Why waste it on Jesus Christ? He's simply not worth it to Judas. But to Mary, she was so grateful that Jesus had returned back to her the life of Lazarus, her brother. And how do you tag the value of one life? You know, how much is a life worth to you? But more than that, how much is Jesus worth to you? Is he worth you giving your best? Jesus was worth so much to Mary, she was willing to sacrifice her most treasured possession and waste it all, pouring it all on him. You know what? Yes, the gospel is free. Salvation is free. The grace of God is free, but the expression of our love to God can be very costly. The expression of love can be very costly. Love costs God, His only begotten Son, Jesus. Love costs Jesus His entire life as He hung there on the cross for you and me. And the more we receive His grace and we receive His mercy, the more extravagant we want to show it the more extravagant we want to pour out our love to Him. Because you know why? Jesus says, He who is forgiven much, loves much. Now, this party was a defining moment for both Judas and for Mary. Let me explain. You need to understand three things about Judas. Number one, Judas was a patriot. He was a patriot. In other words, he loved Israel. In fact, he was fanatical about the nation of Israel. Now, his surname Iscariot is very interesting. Iscariot means the dagger man. So he belonged to a group of ultra zealots who walk around every day carrying a knife, ever ready to kill and assassinate the Romans. He was a patriot, he was an ultra zealot. Judas and his fellow zealots, they have been waiting for a Messiah to come, to lead an insurrection, to lead them into a war against the Romans, and to reestablish the kingdom of Israel, a kingdom they believe prophetically, according to the book of Daniel, that will stand forever. So they've been waiting and waiting for this Messiah to come and to lead them. And when they saw Jesus talking about the kingdom of God, they all go, yes, that's the kingdom we are talking about. When they saw Jesus healing the sick and casting out demons, they said, that's even better. He's a miracle worker. He's worthy to be the leader to lead us to fight against the Romans. But at some point in his interaction with Jesus Christ, he started to hear something that was very troubling. Jesus started talking about his death and crucifixion. He was going to the cross to die for the sin of the whole world. Judas was perplexed. How could this be? 
this is supposed to be the king that will lead us into battle. What do you mean he's going to die? I've been following him for three and a half years. If that is going to be his fate, then this Jesus must surely be the false Messiah. He got disappointed. He was upset. By and by, Judas began to find fault in the things that Jesus did, in the things that Jesus said. Number two, Judas was religious. You got to understand something. He was trained in Scripture. All zealots were trained in Scripture. But they have a twisted understanding of all the prophecies in the Bible. They have a twisted interpretation of God's Word. Everything to them was social and political because they are thinking of a political kingdom. So he said, why was this fragrant oil wasted? For it might have been sold for more than 300 denarii and given to the poor. Now, this was a true statement. Religiously, it was correct. Socially, helping the poor was the right thing to do. He was right. Mary could have sold this perfume and donated the proceeds to help the poor. But Mary wasn't making a donation to meet a need, you see. She was offering something to express her love and worship of Jesus Christ. And this is the important difference. There is a difference between making a donation and giving an offering. When you make a donation, your motivation is to meet a need. But when you give an offering, your motivation is to express your love. It's to express your worship ultimately to God. Now, all throughout the Bible, the building of God's house is never a charity donation campaign. It's a consecration campaign. It's not a charity donation work. Because if it's just for charity and just for donation, then all we need is just the barest minimum to build a functional, multi-purpose hall. But because it is a consecration campaign, then like King David, we understand that the house to be built for the Lord must be exceedingly magnificent and famous and glorious for all the country because it's an expression of our love and our worship. Oh, come on, give the Lord a big hand. Hey, I can't hear you. You want to clap today? Give the Lord a big clap. Hallelujah. And when you read the Bible, charity donations will never bring in the harvest. It is only when you give an offering out of your free will, out of love, out of faith, out of a sacrifice, that the harvest, the abundant blessings of God will come. The third thing you need to know about Judas, Judas was a natural man. He was not spiritually minded at all. He thought and lived in the natural. You see, he was with Jesus, but he didn't have the heart of Christ or the heart for Christ. A zealous patriot, yes. Very religious, yes. But totally natural, in his thinking. Now, I want you to see how Jesus defended Mary and rebuked Judas. Now, remember, this is a defining moment, and I'm going to show you what happened. Mark 14, verse 6, Jesus said, let her alone. Why do you trouble her? She has done a good work for me, for you have the poor with you always. Whenever you wish, you may do them good, but me, you do not have always. She has done what she could. She has come beforehand to anoint my body for burial. So Jesus was saying, hey, Judas, leave her alone. Mary isn't making a donation over here. Mary is sacrificing her best. And because she is spiritual, she has discernment that I'm not going to be around. I'm going to the cross. 
I'm going to be crucified. And she is preparing for my burial. That party, that dinner, became the defining moment for Judas. Already disappointed with Jesus. Already upset with Jesus. This rebuke became the straw that broke the camel's back. Right after the dinner, that same night, in verse 10, then Judas Iscariot, 1 to 12, went to the chief priest to betray him to them. And when they heard it, they were glad and promised to give him money, so he sought how he might conveniently betray him. Church, see this. A disappointment that was not dealt with simmered under the surface until it became unrestrained anger that ultimately led to a demonic possession that caused Judas to betray the Son of God. But this weekend, our focus is not on Judas, but it's on Mary, because this became her defining moment in history. In those days, perfume bottles didn't have screw-on caps or reusable stoppers. So it's not like what we have today. You can unscrew it, pour it out, and then screw it back and keep it for another time. No, 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 no. In those days, they came in a sealed bottle. To pour the oil on Jesus' feet, Mary had to break the bottle and use it once, knowing that once it's being poured, she will never have the bottle again. Mary understood the costliness of love. You know, the Apostle Paul understood it too. He said, I pour out my life as a drink offering of love and worship to my Lord Jesus Christ. I pour out my life. Everything that's within me, I pour it and waste it at the feet of Jesus. David, the man after God's own heart, he says, Psalms 116, What shall I render to the Lord for all His benefits toward me? I will take up the cup of salvation. I will call upon the name of the Lord and I will pay my vows to the Lord now in the presence of all His people. That's why he's called the man after God's own heart, the sweet psalmist of Israel. This pouring of oil became the defining moment of Mary's life and Mary's ministry. Jesus said this of her in verse 9, Assuredly, I say to you, wherever this gospel is preached in the whole world, and we are fulfilling this verse even right here tonight, what this woman has done will also be told as a memorial to her. Each one of us, we who love God, and we love God, and we love God, we will come to a few defining moments of our lives. At least one, some will be two or three or four. We will come to a defining moment, and you will have a revelation, and God will give you an encounter, and it's a defining moment for you to make a decision. Jesus Christ loves you and given his life for you. What will you now do for him? Jesus pours his all for us, for you. What will you now do for him? Will we decide to put our hands to the plow and never look back? Will we break our own bottles of perfume, of very costly oil, and pour it out as a love offering on the feet of Jesus Christ? Or will we be like Judas and end up tragically, totally out of the kingdom of God? Are you a Judas or are you a Mary? When you're in the presence of Jesus, what will you offer to Him? God will bring us into moments when our attitudes and decisions could become crucial turning points in our lives. Would we consider serving Him a waste of our time? Or would we be willing to sacrifice our best and pour out our lives to love and to serve the Lord Jesus Christ? For Judas, who failed to guard his heart, that dinner became the defining moment that eventually led to his tragic end. On the other hand, Mary understood Love that means much, causes much too. 
and through her response, she too had her defining moment. Her act of worship would be forever told as a memorial to her. What do you want to be remembered for? I know you love the Lord Jesus, and you will come to a defining moment for your life too. Will you decide to put your hand to the plow and never look back? Will you break your own bottle of perfume and pour it out as an offering on the feet of Jesus? If you are willing, will you say this prayer from your heart with me? Dear Jesus, thank you for giving your all for me. Give me the grace to love you and to pour out my life to you. Let my life be an act of worship before you for as long as I live. Let my life bring you honor. In your name I pray. Amen. Promises mean much to each of us. And we all value those who keep their promises to us. The promises of God are yes and amen. Every good gift that He has prepared for you is irrevocable. It will never return to Him void. It will always be fulfilled in your life. Kong and Son have put together a collection of promises from God's Word called Irrevocable. To receive your copy of Irrevocable, please visit konghee.com. These unchanging promises will give you the encouragement and hope you need to face the challenges of life. Help Kong continue to reach a world that needs this powerful truth. Again, please visit the website to order your copy from Kong He Ministries. Look for the offer Irrevocable, promises from God directly for your life today. God has given each of us promises to comfort, encourage, and bring joy even during the most troubling times. Visit konghee.com to get your copy of Irrevocable. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for He who promised is faithful. We hope you have been blessed and touched by the Word today. Stay tuned for part two of this sermon. God, God bless, bless and bye. bye. This is the fire of the Spirit in our lives, the Holy One. Love is our heartbeat for one another. Let's be fallen up to stay. This is the life that we are meant to live.